Let's get going. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Monday afternoon of Chem 170 with your host, me, Dr. White. All right. As you know, I graded test number one over the weekend. I sent out a uh, the email with your individual scores, and I've also posted in Blackboard from school, D2L, yeah, Dr. White, D2L, your test scores. Now, I'm going to be going through test number one in a little while with all the answers, but I can cut it out of the video because I just don't want it floating around the internet for the rest of all time. All right, listen carefully. I never, ever judge a student by a score on a test or a grade they get in my course. I never, ever, ever judge a student by a grade they get on a test or the grade they get in my class. Why? Well, a number of years ago, I had a student and that student took Chem 170 and failed it the first time. A year later, took it again. I'm thinking, ah, let me help the student any way I can. And I told the student, guess what? Student failed it again. And finally, a year later, same student came back. And I'm thinking, please, please let her, let the student do well. And the student got an A. At the end of the semester, the student came up to me alone in private and said, I need to explain something. I said, you don't have to explain anything. I said, the first time I took your course, I was having serious medical problems. And I couldn't study. Second time I took your course, I was having serious family problems going on. I really couldn't study. Third time, I'm well, no family problems, and she did well. So I never, and that's happened other times with other students. Things going on in your life, they have nothing to do with chemistry. All right, now I'm going to go through the whole test. If you're not here and watching the video, because I'm going to cut it out, feel free to come to my office hour, or if you need to set up a special time and I can go through the test. If I make a mistake on grading, a student should never be penalized for that. Therefore, check your answers against what I did. If you find a mistake, let me know, and I'll look at your test. And if I made a mistake, I'll correct it. Again, you should never be penalized for any mistake I make on a test. With that, let's get going. As you can tell from taking it, you now understand why I call my practice problems, practice problems, because they help you practice. Now, question I'd have if I were taking this class, what grade am I getting right now? Well, the answer is, look at the score for test one. I'm assuming you handed in all the labs that have been due so far. Don't forget, if you didn't hand in last Thursday's lab, do it today. And by the way, and that grade is for those who did hand it in is already in D2L. Now, if you really want to know what grade you're getting right now, 90 to 100 A, just look at my syllabus, 80 to 89 B, 70 to 79 C, 60 to 69 D, below. Uh, 59 or lower F. However, I dropped the lowest test. And for some of you, this may be the lowest test. So it's still possible for every student to get an A. Some of you might have a little harder route to go, but it's possible. And it's still, I've seen students do that. All right. If you did not do good, if you got below 70, I left the message when I sent out the um, emails with your scores for each answer that you should either come to my office hour or set up a meeting with me on Zoom so I can help you out. I want every student to do well. And if you didn't, I probably can help you. 
All right. Any questions about test number one? Also, save your test number one, because I would highly recommend it. you use it as practice problems for the final exam. All right. Now in the summer, we're working at a much faster clip than the fall or winter, so keep up. I said I would go through the alcohol practice problems, so I better keep my promise. Everybody see alcohol practice problems on your screen right now. Well, let me try again. All right, now do you see it on your screen? Thumbs up, people, help me out. No, hold on. Thank you. Now I'm going to have to do it again. All right, now you should see it. All right, let's go through alcohol problem set. Remember, alcohol is a hydroxyl group on a carbon. And how do you name it? You find the longest chain with the carbon, with the hydroxyl group, OH. Name it as an alkane, drop the E, add OL. And if it's acyclic, not in a ring, you need a number, what carbon that is. And the carbon with the hydroxyl group has priority lowest. When you're in a ring, you don't need a number because everybody knows that carbon is number one. All right, first one. Ooh, hydrox group on a carbon, propane, drop the E, propanol, it's on carbon one. And here we have, ooh, cyclohexane, but hydrox group on carbon, drop the E, O, L, cyclohexanol, no one. And if we look at C, Hydrox group on carbon, one, two, three, four, five. Pentane, drop the E, pentanol, add OL. It's on carbon two. And carbon three, it's your old friend, the methyl group. Now, if we look at D, ooh, hydroxyl group on a ring. How many carbons in the ring? Five. Cyclopentane, alcohol, drop the E, add OL, cyclopentanol. Now, the hydroxyl group carbon in the ring is always going to be one. Well, it's the only functional group, which is what's going to happen in this class. And on carbon two is a isopropyl, carbon three methyl. Now, if you'd put two methyl, three iso, uh, two isopropyl, three methyl cyclopentanol, I'd give you full credit. All right, the other type of nomenclature skill you should have is draw the condensed structure for the following molecule, organic molecules. And if we look at one, start from the right, move left, OL ending, alcohol. If that was Z, pentane, five carbons, and the alcohols on carbon two. Now I should warn you, when I took organic chemistry, my instructor, always put stuff with oxygens all the way on the right. Guess what? So do I. If you started from the other side numbering, that's fine too, but I'll always put the answers where the oxygen is on the right. All right, let's look at B, Cyclobutanol, OL ending, starting from the right. That were E, cyclobutane, and you can have the hydrox group on any carbon. Here we have 3,5-dimethyl, 2-octanol, OL ending, alcohol, E, octane, eight carbons. Where's the hydrox group? Carbon two, 
Remember, always starting for a cyclic from the end of the chain. And here we have, ooh, methyl, di, two of them, and they're on carbons three and five. And here I have pure isopropyl phenol, phenol benzene ring with a hydroxyl group, para one four. Here's the isopropyl. Now this is a common name, ethyl alcohol, ethyl two carbons, the alcohol one of the carbons has a hydroxyl group. And now I can say, if you drive by a gas station and you go in and you look at the pump, the pump says this can, gasoline contains up to 10% ethanol. They don't use the common name, they use that UPAC name. And you know what ethanol is right there. So if I were to ask, give an example place where you can get an alcohol, well, you can say a gas station, the gasoline. All right, three isopropyl cyclopentanol, start at the right, E instead of OL, the OL tells the alcohol, cyclopentane, five carbon ring, carbon one has the hydroxyl group, carbon three isopropyl. All right. Time out for some cold water. And I hate to do this for what happens in the summer where I do both a test key and a problem set the same to morning or afternoon, but we got to get everything done. Technically, this is a internet course. I don't have to do this, but I will. I want you to do well. All right, give the organic product or product sort of following. And if we look at A and B, they're the same reaction. One's in a ring, one's not. Let's do B, double bond acid and water. This is the only reaction I can put on both test one and two. Uh, when it comes to test one, two, three, and four, this the stuff that we covered in that section will ever be on an hourly exam. The final is everything, but relax. Students do good on my final. All right, what do we have that's different? Double bond. Add acid water, break the pi bond, one carbon, it follows Markov the cost rule. One carbon gets H, the other gets OH, and a ring, which students don't like, but Mother Nature and Dr. White do. You've got to count, do some math to count how many carbon hydrogens there are. Top carbon with the double bond, one, two, three bonds, four minus three, remember there's four bonds to carbon, is one hydrogen. The bottom carbon of the ring with double bond has one, two, three, four. Four bonds to carbon, four minus four, zero. So the hydrogen from OH goes to this carbon, which we don't show, and the hydroxyl group goes to the other carbon. Now, the next three, let's just skip D and F, D and E, let's look at F. We have what's different? Carbon with the hydroxyl group, alcohol. We're acting with sulfuric acid and the triangle means heat. And this one, I usually I don't put it down, but I did because I felt like it. The temperature, which tells you it's high heat. And now this is dehydration. And up here, here's general reaction. Carbon with a hydroxyl group adjacent carbon with the hydrogen, you lose hydroxyl and hydrogen water, H2O, and between those carbons, two carbons, you form a carbon-carbon double bond. So here's the hydroxyl group, adjacent carbon is A or B. If I lose the hydrogen from A in the hydroxyl group, I get compound A, the alkene. If I lose the hydrogen from B in the hydrox group, I get compound B. And Zaces rule is you, for the way I teach it for my class, you get the alkene double bond that has, listen carefully, 
the most carbon atoms directly bond to the carbon, so the double bond. And if we look at A right here, there are two carbons. If we look at B, there's one, two, three. Which is greater number? Hopefully I'll pick three. That's what you get, and you don't put down two. Now, G and H, what's different? Alcohol. But it's a secondary alcohol. You oxidize it, lose a hydrogen here, hydrogen from the hydroxyl group, form a carbon oxygen double bond for secondary alcohol. It's a ketone. We'll learn about ketones soon. You will. I already know about them. And therefore, between the, lose this hydrogen, this oxygen, uh, yeah, this hydrogen, hydrogen from the ring, and you form a carbon oxygen double bond. Same thing here. And you can have the double bond oxygen pointing down too. Notice I don't break any carbon carbon seal bonds. If we look at I, it's a primary alcohol, but the same thing. It loses a hydrogen here, hydrogen there form a carbon oxygen double bond. And here we do, all right, J, K, and I. All of them are alcohols. We're reacting with thionyl chloride, SOCl2. And what happens? You replace the hydroxyl group with a chlorine. And therefore, do you break carbon, carbon single bond? No. So if I have this ring, I'll still have the ring and the hydrox group on the carbon hydrox group was is a chlorine. Next, I have an alcohol. And on the carb with thionyl chloride, you have one, two, three, four, plus a methyl group. The carbon with the hydrox group, you replace that and now have a chlorine. And I'll teach you later on why making these type of molecules are very useful for an amazing reaction. Now, similar, but not the same. And we talked about that. Notice we, I talked about that. If you have a hydrox group on a carbon, and you react it with HCl, hydrochloric acid, you replace the hydrox group on that carbon with a chlorine. Everything else comes around for the ride because you don't break carbon, carbon single bonds. So here I still have my methyl group and t-butyl group. On this carbon, the OH is replaced with chlorine. And same thing for N and O. And here I place the hydrox group with a bromine and so on. And finally, Dr. White's lazy. I said, you know, these people could use these people. My students could use another practice problem for Zaysa's rule. So I gave you one. And here, what do we have? An alcohol, carbon with hydroxyl group, sulfuric acid and heat. And this is the reaction. You form a double bond. There's the hydrox group and adjacent carbon with the hydrogen. Adjacent means right next to it. And it follows a such rule. You get the car molecule that has the most, and listen carefully, carbon atoms directly bond to carbon's double bond. Well, here's my hydroxyl group. On carbon A is the hydrogen, carbon B has the hydrogen. If I lose the hydrogen from A in the hydroxyl group, I'll form a double bond between here and I'll get compound A. If I lose the hydrox group and the hydrogen from B, and I'll get a double bond here, I get compound B. Now, which is the one that Zaysus present rule says you'll get? Well, A has only two carbons bond to the carbons, the double bond, one, two. Carbon uh, compound B has one, two, three. And now you have to use your high level mass skills, which is the larger number, two or three. Time's up, and hopefully I'll pick three.
which is why B is the correct answer and A is not. Wow, that was a lot. Time for some water. All right, any questions? All right, where we left off last week, I had talked about ethers. And ethers are where you have an oxygen R and R prime. And as I said, organic chemists, unless it's for legal reasons, like a patent or a contract, don't use IUPAC nomenclature, which you don't have to know, common name each R group as an alkyl group and add the word ether. How do you make an ether? Williamson ether synthesis. Alkoxide, alkyl halide, the carbon with the halogen R prime is the carbon oxygen bond in R prime ether. And you get a salt, but you don't have to put that down. It's wrong color. Right color. And this is your turn, but in case you haven't studied, you should. There you go, your turn. Give the organic product or products for the following reaction. And it's your turn. I just want organic, not the salt. Oops, I gave it away.
All right, since the break is almost on us, let me do this one. We'll do some more after the break. What's the product or product? What's different? Look for what's not carbon. What's not, ooh, oxygen minus sodium cation on a carbon, alkoxide. Carbon, car ooh, halogen on a carbon, alcohol halide. And what do you get in the ether? Notice this carbon right here will be bonded to the oxygen and the ether. So do you break carbon, carbon single bonds? No. So this is my R prime. This is my R. So I'll draw my R prime. This carbon had the halogen. Will we bond the oxygen? What's R? Methyl. I know there are four bonds to carbon, so I can put them in. And you've just made this ether. And with that, oh, I went a whole minute early, over. Sorry, come back at 2.56. I'm going to take a break, and hopefully you will too. I'll see you in five.
Let's get going. All right. Let's do one more ether problem and test one. I only have one synthesis problem on test two coming up soon. Not that soon, but coming up. I believe the end of the month. Uh, hold on. Let's find out. It's the 30th, I think, but let me look it up. And I was right on uh, Thursday, the 30th, which we got next week too, will be test number two. And we've almost covered half the material on that. All right, let's get back on test two. I'll probably have three sentences, remember, any more would be cruel, unusual punishment, at least up to now, the Supreme Court has outlawed that. So, And the question is, give the, or, uh, give the organic starting materials, what two things, that's why I have two question marks, would you, you react to make that molecule? Plus, you also have sodium bromide, a salt. It's your turn. What two things do you react to make this molecule? And don't forget tonight, I have my office hour from six until seven. And at seven, don't forget to watch the Stanley Cup final tonight. Uh, I don't know why, since there's no Chicago team, the Blackhawks aren't in it, unfortunately. I don't know how or why, but 
when two teams are in a final or something like that, and neither are Chicago teams, I'll emotionally be for one. I don't know why I pick one, stick with them. And right now, um, hoping the Avalanche wins. You saw a Saturday night game. Ah, they dominated the Tampa Bay Lightning seven zip in a final in the Stanley Cup. Unbelievable game. Tonight should be interesting. See if the Lightning pop back. If you're done, don't forget to vote in the poll. All right, let's get going. We look at this, the product, what's different? Ooh, an oxygen and carbons here and carbons here. What is that? An ether. And notice I have a salt too, where X can be chlorine, in our case, it's bromine, or iodine. And how do you make an ether plus a salt? You start with an alkoxide, RO minus Na plus, and react that with an alkyl halide. And as I said, this is what X can be. Now, I can say this is R, and this is R prime. And if that's the case, R is ethyl, the alkoxide here is this. Now, the carbon here that has the oxygen is the carbon here with the halogen. Do you break carbon carbon single bonds? Our prime has three, it better start with three. And the N carbon has the halogen. What's that halogen? Bromine. I know there are four bonds to carbon, I can put in my hydrogens. Now, I could also have said, and this is a fun part about synthesis, make this R prime and this R. Well, if I do that, R has an alkoxide, three carbons. The carbon with the oxygen here, is the same carbon with the oxygen here. And then my R prime is two carbons. And let's call this A and B, which is correct, A or B. And the answer is both are for my class because I'm not asking you to learn accounting. Any questions on ethers? I'm looking at the chat.
going once, going twice, let's move on. And guess what? It's push down my collar. No, it's new functional group time. New functional group, yay. And what's the new functional group? Well, let's take a look at the chapter. If this comes down, there we go. And the new functional group is called an epoxide. Now, what is an epoxide? Well, I have in general an epoxide here. Epoxide is a carbon, two of them. Each bond, it's an oxygen. So you have a ring with two carbons and an oxygen. Now, at first glance, you'd say, wow, that looks like an ether. But no. Why? Because it undergoes chemistry ethers don't undergo. Therefore, it has to be a different functional group. Now, good news. I will not cover nomenclature of epoxides at all, either common or ask you to learn common or IUPAC. Now, I should mention, be honest with you, which I always have been, is this is an area I've worked in heavily. Uh, to my US patents, utilize reactions of epoxides. So I guess I know a little about it. Ah, that's an understatement. All right, now, well, I don't have a slide, so I better do it the old fashioned way. Now for this class and really in the United States and the world, the most important epoxide is this one, the simplest. This has a common name, which you don't have to know. Ethylene oxide. And ethylene oxide is a gas at room temperature. And I've worked with this. I supervise uh, reactions in chemical plants using ethylene oxide. Now. I'm going to try and be a good chemist and a good teacher, not use slang. If you work in the industry using ethylene oxide, the chemical industry, we don't even call it that. Organic chemists are lazy. We call it, and this is the only time I'll try, I'll say it and try not to say it when I'm teaching you this, is EO. And Dr. White worked a lot with ethylene oxide. We're in the plant and even in meetings, we call it EO but I won't, I'll call it ethylene oxide, but you don't even have to learn that word. All right, now ethylene oxide is a three-membered ring and it's really strained. It doesn't like being strained. The bond angles are really strained high energy. And if you react to a water, by the way, switches off, click for this reaction. Let me do the right hand. Switches off, click for that re this reaction. When you work with ethylene oxide, you never want water around because it makes ethylene glycol and it uses up a lot of uh, ethylene oxide and that won't help you make what you're trying to make. So whenever you run an ethylene oxide reaction, you want to make sure the reactor you're working with and all the chemicals you're reacting with ethylene oxide are dry. Now, ethylene oxide, and time for a Dr. White story, ethylene oxide is a very dangerous chemical. It's usually shipped and sold under pressure in railroad cars mainly, or tank wagons too, but I've just seen them in railroad cars. And the bad thing about ethylene oxide, you get enough oxygen in there, Guess what? Boom, it blows up. Yep, it's that dangerous. And one company I worked at was located in Gurney. Uh, I don't know how many miles, five or six miles, maybe a little longer, north 
uh, east of Great America here in Illinois, way up near the Wisconsin border in Gurney. In fact, half our plant, at the end, it was a research of plant, came from Wisconsin, the other Illinois. And when the Green Bay Packers played the Bears, who, who was interesting in the plant, uh, the taunts would go on. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you what people would call each other. But anyways, one afternoon, we had finished early. The research group I was with, we're sitting around about 10, 15 minutes before we're going to go home. Since everybody's finished, we're just shooting, uh, the, talking. Uh, and someone said, you know, right outside in the plant across uh, 100 yards from there, we have two huge ethylene oxide storage tanks each about a million pounds. These are huge. And the person said, if it blows up, do we take out Great America or not? Now already that person knew and everybody in that room knew if they blew up, we'd be dead like that. And the question was, would the blast from that explosion, how much damage it would it do to Great America that distance away? And most of us agreed, it wouldn't kill anybody, but it would, might hurt some people knocking over things and stuff. But that's working with ethylene oxide. And it's one of those chemicals I always say separates people who should be organic chemists from those who shouldn't be. Because the first time I worked with ethylene oxide in the lab, boy, <laughs> I was, mm, mm. and then I was very careful. And the company I worked for, the first time anybody worked with ethylene oxide, you had someone there who knew what they were doing, watch you. And then after that, you get used to it. You always are careful with it. And I've done a lot of reactions in the lab with these hands. And I've also supervised in a chemical plant, 40,000 pound batches. All right, let's talk about ethylene oxide reaction. The first one is, since it's a chapter on alcohols, the reaction of ethylene oxide with one molecule of an alcohol. So let me rewrite this reaction for you. If you take any alcohol and react it with ethylene oxide, One of the bonds between carbon and oxygen is broken. This part will go to the carbon that was bond to oxygen, and this will go to the oxygen. Oh, excuse me, I burped, sort of. And what you get is this molecule. And here you go. Now, look carefully. It's got not one, but two functional groups, carbons, oxygen, carbons, ether, carbon, hydroxyl group, alcohol. So this has an ether alcohol, two functional groups in the same molecule. All right, let's have some fun with this. Oops. And the question is, give the organic product or products for the following reaction. But before we do this, this general reaction, next one dealing with epoxides, I will never put a synthesis problem on the test for you to do. They're harder and I won't do that. That's not right. And I, you know, I go teach by my golden rule of teaching. I don't do the students what I wouldn't like done to me. So, but you should know how to predict the products or products. How do we do this? What's different? Hydrox group on a carbon, alcohol. What's this? Ooh, ethylene oxide. 
And what do you get? R O C H two C H two O H. This gets put on replacing the hydrogen of the alcohol. So what's my R group? This, the carbon with the hydroxyl group is the carbon this oxygen will be bonded to. They break carbon, carbon single bonds. No, so I have one, two, three. That's my R group, oxygen. Then CH2, CH2OH. The bond here between that carbon, that oxygen, is the same carbon that had the hydroxyl group. And I know there are four bonds to carbon. And there you go. Your turn. Now remember the carbon with the hydroxyl group is the carbon this oxygen is bonded to. And there's one for you to have fun with. Again, I'll never put this on a test as a synthesis problem. I was about to check the mail earlier today and I realized no mail. It's a federal holiday, June 19th. And for those who are celebrating, happy June 19th. I think I'm pronouncing it wrong. Well, it's a new holiday. In case you don't know, today was the day even though it was two years after President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation that the last slaves in the United States were finally freed. It's a good reason to celebrate a holiday. All right, let's do this. Oh, wait a second, I should be nice. Time for you to vote. Hold on. There, <laughs> that should help you. All right, I think everybody's done, so I can get the work. We look at this problem, we look for what's different, what's not a carbon, what's not a hydrogen. In this chapter, that will be fine. Ooh, an oxygen with a hydrogen and a carbon, alcohol. What's this? Carbon, carbon, oxygen in the three-membered ring, ethylene oxide. And what do you get? This. Ether alcohol. What's my R group? 
isopropyl, three carbons. You don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. And the carbon with the hydroxyl group is the carbon bonded to this right here. So oxygen, CH2, CH2, OH. And I know there are four bonds to carbon, so I can put this in. And there you go. Oh, this was too much fun. I've got to let you try another one. Again, I'll never put a, oops, sorry about that. I'll never put a synthesis problem. And here's one more for you to have fun with. Have fun. While you're doing that, I'm going to play with my new toy. It's a special flashlight, eh? this guy. made by one of the great flashlight makers who makes probably the best flashlights in the world. Hank Wang, who's in China, has about 8,000, 7,000 people in a subreddit who's just interested in buying flashlights from Hank Wang. He's that good. You know something, I can see everybody's screen. If you're done, give me a thumbs up. See one person done. Excuse me, I got up way too early this morning. All right, and well, I'll be quiet. Anybody else done? Remember, thumbs up.
All right, let's move forward. I assume you're done unless somebody yells at me, stop, I'm not done. And if we look at this molecule right here, what's different? Ooh, what's that carbon? What's that hydrogen oxygen with a hydrogen and a carbon? That's an alcohol. Ooh, two carbons and oxygen and ring, ethylene oxide. And what do you get? You get this. Ether alcohol. And the carbon in the R with the hydroxyl group is the same carbon this oxygen is bonded to. Well, what's my R group? Right here, four carbons. You break carbon, carbon seal bonds? No. And next, I'll have an oxygen, CH2CH2OH. And here's the molecule you get. Now, one of the things I'll be doing more and more is ask you to ask the question, why am I learning this stuff? Well, the obvious answer is you want to get a good grade in my class because someone said you had to take organic chemistry to either get in a program like physician's assistant or nursing school or get in a program or school because you need organic chemistry. Well, really? Why should you learn this stuff? Well, let's talk about the reaction you just did. In order to do that, why are you learning this stuff? And I should mention, I'm getting to some stuff you wouldn't believe, but I'm just talking about the chemical side of it, nothing about the moral side of anything. All right, now, let me close a couple things here. All right, everybody see on your screen, give me a thumbs up. Deep water horizon oil spill. Anybody out there? Thank you, Jimmy. All right, now it's been a while. Back in April of 2010, wow, 12 years ago, seems like just yesterday, one of the worst ecological damaging occurrences happen in the Gulf of Mexico. And there was an oil well drill platform called Deepwater Horizon. I don't know how they got the name. And if the safety features fail and the oil, the oil well that they were drilling or had drilled started leaking crude oil, lots of it lots of it. And I don't know if they have uh, how much, let's see, the federal government estimated 210 million gallons. I calculated based on what they were saying the leak was, and it was a lot higher than that. Even this number is tremendous damage, ecological damage. Now, I am an industrial organic chemist. I worked many decades in the industry, but by then I was already teaching and I happened to be home. And I saw that in the news, I'm in, not inhaling, but following it closely with someone who knows industrial organic chemistry. 
and all of a sudden they were reporting, here's these millions of gallons of oil being, and every gallon is eight pounds. So we're talking close to a billion pounds of oil being put into the Gulf of Mexico that's doing tremendous damage to the ecology of that area and polluting it badly. And they were to disperse oil, because I'll teach you later, there's a rule of thumb, this thumb, like the cells like, what that means is oil will not dissolve in water. And I'll teach you more about that down the road this semester. Well, they were using a special chemical to disperse the oil so it wouldn't be in these big floating messes. And hopefully it was safer. No, it wasn't. And they reported on the news that the dispersant was from a company actually here called Nalco, which is since owned by a French company, but I think it's still called a Nalco uh, division. And it's located in Naperville, not far from here. And what was that dispersant? Well, they put in about almost 2 million gallons and it was called Corexit, which I don't see here. Let's see. Here it is, Corexit oil. And there are a couple of versions of this. And if you click on correct, uh, Corexit, I don't know if they have the one here, the two versions, 94 something, it's been a while. Here, 9527 and 9500. Now I'm gonna teach you something right now that will never be on a test. Well, it's a good thing for you to know. Every chemical that's manufactured in the United States, every chemical that's sold in a product in the United States, there's what's called in every product that contains chemicals, a material safety data sheet. And chemists call it, or in industry at least, MSDS. Some people call it SDS, MSDS, material safety data sheet, or safety data sheet, SDS. And guess what? With the internet now, you can find the MSDS for anything. It's about. If you notice right now, let's see if you're on there, you should see Corexit, and there are a couple of them now. They've since been, how should I say, sanitized. But let's look here uh, from CDC right here. Uh, it's not really an MSDS sheet. Let's see if this will take us. Generally, when you're looking for MSDS sheets, look for a company name. It's some of the companies that used to have it. Let's try something. Now let's go here and see what I can find. All right, here's the Nalco. All right, everybody see the MSDS sheet on your screen? Not now, I <laughs> just spit the wrong. Thumbs up people, can you see it right here? Nalco, Corexit, EC9. Thank you, Janet. All right, now there's similar, Part one gives you the name, part two, and this is important, gives you the ingredients. 
And notice the second one, 2-butoxyethanol. I wonder, what's that? I know propylene glycol isn't that bad and isn't that good. So I said, hmm, I better look up this MSDS sheet. And that's because I'm a responsible organic chemist, industrial. So I did the following. And I know Sigma Aldridge is a very reputable company. It's located in Milwaukee. Let me get, oh, I'll accept your cookies. And here it has it. And notice over here, they have an SDS, which same as MSDS. I want an English. And here we have it. And this parts are similar, the name, details, and classification. Now, these are hazards. If you notice, it's acutely a toxic oral. It's at the highest level for inhalation. It's the highest level for skin toxicity. And it's bad for your eyes and skin. This is the vapor. This is dangerous stuff. Now, back in 2010, the MSDS had more detail, like it kills fish. They said marine life. Here they're pumping millions of gallons of this chemical, Corexit, that contains up to 60% of this chemical. You're talking, to, if I have uh, 2 million gallons, 60% of that, is 1.2 million gallons of very hazardous material to make something bad better? Nope. Well, as soon as I saw that, I called the Coast Guard who was in charge. I was able to get to the lead chemist, who unfortunately was the academic chemist, nothing wrong with academic chemists, but they don't have the experience industrial chemical. So I said, this is bad stuff, you should stop it. So no, it's the first, said it's killing, it's going to do as much, if not worse, damage to the sea life and people around there trying to clean up. They said no. And I finally got number two at the Coast Guard. Yes, I'm persistent. And I've been, how should I say, raised by my parents to be socially responsible. And I'm a socially responsible organic chemist. Well, I couldn't get, I got to the number two person at the Coast Guard in charge of spill. Well, our chemists say it's not that good, not that bad. He said, no, it's too bad. Well, he wouldn't listen to me. So what did I do? I contacted the New York Times, MSNBC, television, and I also contacted CNN and told them, and I'm sure I'm not the only ones. And not too long after that, those people were saying, this is bad. And finally, the EPA banned it, but they already put enough in. Fast forward to about four or five years ago. And I saw an article about the cleanup and the fact that workers afterward and were suffering from these medical conditions and the medical conditions they were suffering from what they said in that MSDS, which I had complained years earlier. And I saw one or two authors and I was able to track it down. I called them up or emailed them and said, you know, this is so-and-so. And I, back then, this is what I did. And it looks like, unfortunately, what I predicted was came about. And he emailed me back and thanked me and said, here's a phone number. You should call this person. That was the other author on that article. And turned out the other author had been a journal, is still is or was a journalist back then and decided to volunteer to be on the ships that helped clean up that oil spill from the ocean and also the beaches. And you know, you saw the pictures of the birds covered in oil and they use uh, laundry, uh, dishwasher detergent to clean them off, which was safe and saved the birds' lives. Well, I talked to him, what I heard was disgusting. Turns out everything I predicted, he talked to me about the men and women worked on those boats and worked on the beaches cleaning up. 
they suffered medical problems due to core exit. And he said, I only was there for a short time, so I didn't have it, but you could smell something in the air. Well, some things are good, some things are bad. Why am I bringing it up? Because the product you just made right here is the key ingredient in Corexit. It's the IUPAC name is 2-butoxyethanol. And how do you take it? And butyl alcohol, ethylene oxide, and that's how you make it. So some things are good and some things, well, are not the best. And that's my story. All right. You know something, sometimes I do this and this would be a good time. Let's take a little longer break. Come back at 3.50. I'll give you an extra minute because it doesn't make sense to rush through something that will take time. So come back at 3.50 and we'll continue. Again, come back at about six minutes and we'll continue. Maybe six minutes and a half. I'll see you at 3.50.
Oh no, I'm running late. Let's get going. All right, now we are talking about the reaction of ethylene oxide with an alcohol. Let's go back and look at this. Now, the reaction, alcohol plus ethylene oxide reacts to make this ether alcohol. Remember ether? And here, alcohol. Now I'm gonna do something right now with this reaction. Don't write it down. I had to itch my ankle, sorry about that. And let me illustrate something again. Don't write this down. But you can always go back and look at the video. But if I were in a classroom, I'd be doing some whiteboard telling students, don't write this down. Now, here we have an alcohol, ethylene oxide. My R group is methyl. And I'll form this ether alcohol. But now look at what we just made. At this end, I have an alcohol. And now this whole thing right here is my R group. So I can react it with more ethylene oxide. And I will. What's my R group? CH3, O, CH2, CH2. And then I'll get this part added on. O, then another CH2, CH2, OH. And if we look at this product, what is at the end here? Another alcohol. So I can react this, which is an alcohol. Now my R group is this, with more ethylene oxide, and I will. And what happens, my R group now is this. And then I'll have my oxygen, CH2, CH2, OH. If we look at this new product, I have an alcohol here and I could add more and more like the Energizer Bunny. I don't get any money back from them. Boom, boom, boom. I could keep on reacting. In real life, companies do. But let's look at what this is. Now, Notice after one mole of ethylene oxide, this is a product. So this is the first molar molecule. This is the second one. This is the third one. Now, if we look at the final product after addition of three molecules, or in chemistry, we call that moles of ethylene oxide, notice in this product here, the repeating unit, one, two, three. And I can rewrite this molecule like this. CH3, what's my repeating unit? O, CH2, CH2. And it's repeating, so I'll put it in a bracket. How many times did it repeat? One, two, three. And then at the very end here is the hydroxyl group outside the bracket. So these are the same. This is an easier way of writing it. Now let's look at this. How many moles of ethylene oxide or molecules do we react with our original alcohol? One, two, three. So I could have written it like this.
And now if we look at this, what's the product? Well, I can write it like this. And notice the number of molecules or moles of ethylene oxide indicates how many times OCH2 CH2 repeats. And what this reaction is, let's go back to our slides for the chapter, is the following reaction. If you react, the, and I have it written this way, but you can also write it this way. If you take an alcohol and react it with N moles of ethylene oxide, you get this molecule. And notice I have the brackets showing the OCH2CH2 repeating. O, R, inside the bracket is OCH2CH2, then close bracket N, then outside OH. And the number of moles or molecules of ethylene oxide tell you what N is. And this is very important. I worked for a company, and that was in, by Great America, that did this with different alcohols. And N could be 2, 5, 10, 20, 25. And in the lab we made for customers to test, and up to and over 100. But usually it was either 2, 5, 10, 15, 20, or 25. And these were important molecules. So let's try this reaction. Oops, that's the wrong thing. And the question is, what's the organic product or product? I'm about to <laughs> sneeze. <laughs> oh, it always happens when I was doing too much yard work. I know something outside sometimes gets to my nose. Yesterday, I spent about four hours in the morning doing some serious battle with another mother nature, otherwise known as yard work, because it had been so hot. I never had time with my schedule. And yesterday it wasn't that bad. It was actually rather nice. All right, let's get back to this. What's different? What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? Oxygen with a hydrogen and a carbon? Alcohol. Ooh, that's unusual. The number in front in a chemical equation this is called a coefficient. I'll never ask that on test. But you got a number there. I'll call it N in front of ethylene oxide. And what do you get? R bracket O CH2 CH2 close bracket subscript N OH. Now, common mistake on test number two is students put this inside there, which is wrong. Nothing like that exists. And guess what? I mark it wrong. This is always outside of this bracket. So what's my R group? Three carbons. You break carbon, carbon, single bonds. No. So I have one, two, three. The carbon with the hydrox group is this carbon that's bonded to or lined to the bracket O carbon, carbon, close bracket, what's N? We look right there, the coefficient six OH. And now I know there are four bonds to carbon and I'll put in my hydrogens. And there you go. Now I'll teach you later in the semester when we get into what's called surfactants, 
these type, and they're called a foxylated alcohols uh, products. The foxylated alcohols are used as surfactants, surface active agents. And they're very important in things like cosmetics and personal care products like shampoo, hair conditioner, and other things you use for personal care. In fact, the company I worked for, PPG Mazer, which since sold it to someone else, this was years ago, I, we sold to major companies like Neutrogena and others, and also cosmetics. All right, time for you to have some fun. And this reaction in the previous one, any reaction with ethylene oxide, I will never ask for you to do a synthesis problem. And it's your turn. Give the organic product or products for the following. Three points each. And now you know why I say that. You can shut off your camera and mic if you kind of blow your nose. And I did. And when you're done, please give me a thumbs up. Let's see if you guys do that. And don't forget, commercial from Dr. White. I have my office hours tonight from 6 to 7 on Zoom. If you have any questions, need any help, or just want to say hello to Dr. White, stop on by. All right. Let's find out something. Are you done? All right, let's do this. If we look at this reaction, 
what's different in the first compound? What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? Ooh, oxygen with a hydrogen on a carbon? That's an alcohol. I'm reacting with ethylene oxide. Three-member ring, carbon, two carbons and a hydrogen, uh, hydrogen oxygen. But wait, I have a coefficient that's not one. And I'll call that N. And what do you get? You get this poly, poly means many, ether, alcohol. And here in the bracket are polyether N. And outside the bracket, hint, remember, is your hydrox group, your alcohol. Now, N here dictates what N is here, there. Now, what's our R group? My favorite, a T butyl group. Dr. White's happy. And then you have an oxygen in a bracket, CH2, CH2. And what's N here? Well, eight, subscript eight, hydroxyl group. And that's how you do it. Oh, let's do one more. Let's have a lot of fun. All right, now let me give you a little help on this problem. This is just an R group, nine carbons, single carbon, carbon, single bonds. That won't react with ethylene oxide. Oh, look, I have a benzene ring. That will not react with ethylene oxide. But what's a carbon with a hydroxyl group? Yep, it's an alcohol, and it's your turn to have some fun. If I can move this down give the organic product or products for the following reaction. Your turn. Remember, ethylene oxide will not react with the benzene ring or this R group on the benzene ring with nine carbons. But it will react with an alcohol. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up, or I guess I'll do the poll, because I wonder, can all of you do a thumbs up? Oh, you can. All right. I hope you're all finding the videos that I post each 
of our lecture days, Monday through Thursday, useful. All right, let's do this. If I look at this molecule right here, what's different? Well, I got a benzene ring. I, this is this carbon-carbon single bonds. So that's not different. But this one, benzene ring, won't react with ethylene oxide. But I have a carbon with a hydroxyl group. And the answer is that will react. That's an alcohol. Yep, this whole thing right here is this R. And I have, ooh, number nine. N moles or molecules of ethylene oxide, two carbons. Each carbon is bonded together and also bonds an oxygen. Three membered ring, two carbons, one oxygen. What do you get? R bracket OCH2. CH2, close bracket, subscript, N from there, and then OH, a poly, meaning many, ether alcohol. So what's my R group? A benzene ring, and the pair position is C9H19. This is called an alkyl group, and it's called nonal. And you don't have to know it for my class, then this whole thing is my R. And now I'll have a bracket OCH2, CH2, close bracket. What's N? Goes here, and that's nine, and then OH. Ooh, nine disappeared. And that's what you get. Now, earlier today, I said, you should be asking, why am I learning this stuff? Well, the obvious answer is, as I've said, I found out the first day you're here to take this class because somebody said you need it. And you need it to get into a program or a college and something like nursing or physician's assistant dietitian, whatever. And hope I didn't miss your major. But why are we learning this? What I'm going to listen carefully, what I'm going to talk about next, I'm not taking any kind of moralistic stance. It's just talking about chemistry, organic chemistry. And that's not what I want. That's what I want. Now, it turns out the molecule we just made has a trade name, nonoxyl 9. And here it is. You just made that. You take a nonophenol OH benzene ring C9H19, reacted with nine moles of ethylene oxide, and you get this molecule. Now, these are called surfactants. I'll teach you later about surface active agents. That's what surfactant is short for. But this one has a special use. It's a spermicide, kills sperm. Again, I'm just showing the organic chemistry. In no way am I taking a more realistic view. All right, thumbs up, people. 
Do you see on your screen, Wikipedia, no noxal nine. Let me make sure you should be seeing it. And you should. Everybody seeing that? Click on your thumbs up if you see it. Thank you. All the J, oh, I've got three J's. Jimmy, Janet, and Jordan. Now, nonoxyl 9 has this structure, which is essentially using the line method, the molecule we just made. Over here, our group, nine carbons. That's what this bracket, and I'm glad I don't use the line method in class or on my test. Benzing ring pair position, O, CH2, CH2, nine times, and OH. Now, what is the nonoxyl 9 used for? It's a spermicide. It kills sperm by making them stop. That's really professional. And where can it be found? On condoms. Again, I'm just talking about professional uh, organic chemistry in your daily life. If you go to any big box store like Target, or as a friend of mine calls it, the French store, Target, or Walmart, nobody calls it Walmart, no, anyways, and you go over to the place where they sell condoms, both stores have them, and you pick up a lubricated condom, it will say contains the Noxyl 9. Now, for certain people, women who use cervical barrier for birth control, you use a diaphragm jelly and it contains the Noxyl 9. Now, what's more interesting, it's a lubricant. And what's even more interesting, it's a lubricant in shaving cream. Now, as you can see, I shave here, but because I have, when I don't shave, such a tough beard. I long ago gave up using any kind of blade or razor. It just irritates the heck out of them. Electric razors do much better, which is what I use, three head nor alcohol, where I trim this and a little right here, a little right there. But if you think about it, nonoxyl 9 is the lubricant to help your blade if you do use a blade, which explains why men with who use that in shaving cream don't get pregnant faces. All right, one other one, which is quite interesting, and it acts as a surfactant. If you get poison ivy, you know, where you want to rip your arms apart, they have a product that has nonoxyl 9 as its active ingredient. And what it does is it helps remove the chemical and poison ivy which is this right here, which is this diol, that this one irritates the heck out of your skin. And that helps stop the rash and the uncomfort. So how do you make this molecule? You take, wrong slide, right slide. You take nine moles of ethylene oxide, with this is called nonophenol. Now remember I said OH group on a benzene ring, people call it phenol. Guess what? Everybody calls this nonophenol. Well, if you drop the nonol, P-H-E-N-O-L, how come you don't call that nonol or phenol all the time, which I do. And I still, when I worked at a company that used a lot of nonophenol, we had a running argument with phenol and nonophenol. And I'll never in this reaction right here or the previous one with ethylene oxide ask a synthesis questions on the test or in the final. That's not right. All right, now if we look at this, oh no, we finished another chapter, which means We've just finished the ethers and epoxides chapter. 
ta da. What that means is this, let's see, today's Monday. This Wednesday, I will go through the ethers and epoxide problem set. Summer's getting this fast. And even in the fall, winter, when we get to this part, I'm picking it up somewhat. Make sure you spend a lot of time practicing, or you're not going to like what you see on your test boards. Practice the general reactions, write them down five times. Now, if I look at the clock, we've got time to go back and do one more practice problem in alcohols that students always have problems with. And let's take a look at that. And um, from experience, when I put something like this on test number two, uh oh, I gave it away. Students get it wrong. So let's practice this. And sometimes I'll put 180 degrees C. I'm getting lazy. I'm not going to do that. Now, I'm going to help you out. And this reaction. Here's the general reaction to help you out. And it's a dehydration. You have a carbon with a hydroxyl group and an adjacent carbon, carbon next bonded to that carbon. You have a hydrogen and you lose water to form a double bond between these two carbons. And it follows a set's rule. The product you get has the most carbon atoms directly bonded to the carbons of the double bond. Your turn to have fun. Remember, it's your turn to do this problem.
And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. Remember, Zaysef's rule is you get the product that has the most carbon atoms directly bonded to the carbons of the double bond that's formed. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. <laughs> Excuse me. I think I'm getting allergic to chemistry now. All right, let's try a poll. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's move forward. All right, now, here we have an alcohol. and adjacent carbons, and let me go color, A and B, both have hydrogens adjacent. Next, attached to the, they're attached to the carbon with the hydroxyl group. If I lose ox, hydroxyl from here, hydrogen from A, I lose water, 
And for A, I would form, and let me put B here. You have five carbons, one, two, three, four, methyl group. Here are my two carbons right here, and I'll form a double bond between there. I'll put in the hydrogens because I know there are four bonds to carbon. And that's what you get. Now, if I come over here and say, well, I could lose the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen from carbon B. And if I do that between the carbon with the hydroxyl group and the carbon B, I'll form a carbon carbon double bond. I still have my five carbons, four plus a methyl. Now these two carbons, I'll form a double bond. Now Zaysef's rule is you count the carbons directly bonded to the carbons of the double bond and the product you get has the most of those carbons. Again, you count the carbon atoms. This is unique in chemistry, organic chemistry. This one has one. You don't count these because they're not directly bonded to these carbons. Here are my two carbons double bond. I have one, two, three. Now, which is a greater number? One or three? And hopefully you would guess three, this is not what you get. And this is the product predicted by Zaysef's rule. And I thought it would help to do an extra one. And you can go back and look at the video. Any questions? All right, well, I thought I'd do that practice problem. And what that means is, it's new chapter time. Boy, we're moving quickly. It's new functional group time. Actually, two of them, they're similar. Now I have to warn you, if it looks like I'm having way too much fun, I am because we're gonna talk about, and they're called aldehydes and ketones. And mother nature and Dr. White love aldehydes and ketones, I really do. My PhD thesis work on aldehydes and ketones, my first and last patents. First one dealt with what I could do with an aldehyde nobody else could. And the last one, what I could do with a certain type of ketone that nobody else could or had found out what they could do. And that's why Dr. White loves aldehydes and ketones They've been good to me, I've been good to them. And I gotta open up that chapter. And while I'm doing that, don't forget, Wednesday, we will go through the ethers and epoxide problem set. Oh, that's not what I wanted. That's what I wanted. All right, everybody see aldehydes and ketones on your screen? Thumbs up, people. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Jordan. All right, what's an aldehyde? An aldehyde is a carbon double bond to oxygen. And on the carbon double bond to oxygen, you have carbons, R, and a hydrogen. This is an aldehyde. Carbon, double bond to oxygen, hydrogen, carbons here, aldehyde. Now you can draw without showing the carbon there. And sometimes I'll do that on tests. I try and stay away from that. Another way of drawing an aldehyde is this one. And if you count bonds to carbon, you know, oops, just thought I changed 
ink hold on you know there's a double bond now i don't like this way i usually draw it like this or most likely like this and that's an aldehyde Now, if you have something similar, a carbon double bond to oxygen with two R groups, R, and notice I have here R prime. That means these can be the same or different. And this is called a ketone. And a ketone is not written with a Y, even though students do that, and I don't take off for spelling. Now, I can draw it like this, but usually I try and stay away from there and show the carbon. And a lot of times I'll draw it like this. This is a ketone. And if we go back, or I go over to my whiteboard, This is an aldehyde. And this is a ketone. Now, if you notice, they're similar. They both have a carbon oxygen double bond. And because of that, their chemistry in a lot of reactions is similar. The only difference, the aldehyde on this carbon has an R group and a hydrogen, and the ketone has two R groups. But most reactions, and all the ones I'll show you, both the hydrogen R group or the two R groups come along for the ride, because you don't break carbon-carbon single bonds. And you'll have to wait until tomorrow to learn more about ketones and aldehydes. But Dr. White and Mother Nature love aldehydes, oops, excuse me, love aldehydes and ketones. Now, don't forget, this Wednesday, I will go through the or ether and epoxide problem set. Do it before I do. That will help your grade. Tonight from six to seven, I'll have my office hour on Zoom, different login, and you're all invited to stop by, say hello, or ask questions. And with that, I'm gonna let you out a whole 60 seconds early, and I'm gonna say, gang gesund, I'll see you tomorrow. And don't forget the lab that is due tomorrow, do it, the spice, you know, the one you smelled uh, aromatic compounds lab. And with that, I'll say, gang gesund, goodbye.